Hey everybody, Steve Beecham here. I want to, you know, I'm doing this series on local rock stars. And so my goal is to find people in the community that know a lot about something that I think a lot of us could learn from. And so today I've got my buddy John Holman here with me. And John is uh, 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 an interesting guy from the standpoint, if you've ever thought about buying a house and flipping it, or buying a house and renting it, or buying a house and, um, you know, and, and adding on to it and selling it, John's bought probably over 600 houses just in the metro Atlanta area. And he's been very instrumental in that business and knows a lot about it. So I asked John to come and, and be with us today and talk to us a little bit about that. So, John, tell me um, how you got started from whatever it was you were doing to being in the house buying business. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me here, Beach. Uh, I was working in the IT business so 15, 18 years ago. Got tired of the corporate world and decided to get in real estate for a reason I don't remember anymore. <laughs> but I talked to everybody I knew about real estate and ultimately started buying and selling houses. And I joined this organization that does that and learned a lot and started buying, rehabbing, and retailing houses back in about 2000, the year 2000. So you've been doing it for a while now. Yeah. Okay, so... If, if, you know, I get these phone calls from people and they say, hey, Beach, I want to go, uh, I want to go buy this house and I want to flip it. I, yeah. I see it on television. I'm reading about it. I, I, I think I can do that. I've got money in my 401k or my daddy's going to help yeah. me or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So I want you to walk me through. So if, 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 if I am trying to find a house to buy, let's start from that standpoint. I'm yeah. trying to find a house. What are some of the ways that you would suggest to me, you know, because I don't do, I don't probably have all the database and resources that you do, but what are some ways that you've seen that really work for me to go find a deal on a house or the right house to buy? Well, that's actually the hardest challenge for any full-time investor is finding the deals. Once you get them, they're not hard to turn around, but finding deals at the right price is the biggest challenge we all face. There are several ways you can do it. You can talk to real estate agents, talk to other investors, uh, sometimes we actually drive around neighborhoods and send letters to homes that are vacant, either vacant or in obviously poor condition. We send a letter that says, hey, I'm thinking about buying a house in this neighborhood. Do you know anybody who wants to sell? How do I find that person's name and address? It's in the public record. You that, can, you so can, that is, so give me that, that's, yeah. tell me that as a dummy, Where's the, what's the public record? The, all real estate in this country is, the owners of real estate is recorded in the public record. You can go down the uh, county county courthouse, courthouse. county courthouse, and physically look through the records. But most of that is online. I don't do that personally anymore, so I don't know what the services are that would let you do it. There used to be one called RealQuest that may still be around. RealQuest.com. Or I could go on uh, Fulton County Tax yep. Assessor's Office, yep. put the address That's in. That's right. It'll give me the That's name. Right. Of That's it. right. Well, if the person doesn't live there and it's a rental house, will it give me the owner's address? It will. It will. There's typically two addresses on every property, the what they call the situs address, which is where the house is, and then the owner's address, if it's different, it'll have a different address for the owner. And that's an indication, if there's a different address there, that it's a rental house. That's cool. All right, so how much success to, would you say you'd have with something like that? Well, yeah, you can. it works, but it's time consuming to look for all these vacant houses and get the addresses and look it up and then start sending letters, it works, but it's a labor-intensive process. All right, so is there another process you like better? Well, for us, we uh, we advertise publicly that we buy houses, and people call us. Okay, it but let's say money, I, but I, don't, it's easier. I don't have that money to do that, right. so what's another right, thing I right. could do? Probably the best thing to do, easiest thing to do, is to talk to real estate agents, and especially the ones that deal with investors, if you can find them. In every community, every significant town in this country, there are real estate investors associations groups. There, it's a, uh, abbreviated R E I A, Real Estate Investor Association. So you RIA. Can, RIA. You can Google the RIA groups in any city, Atlanta, Denver, uh -huh. Dallas, anywhere else, and you'll find those groups. They typically have a meeting a month, one or two in some cases. Go to the meeting. You can join the organization if you want to, and you're going to be in rooms full of investors, and and quite often they will bring lists of houses that they found that they're trying to sell to somebody else. So agents and the real estate investor would the, groups. Would the agents be in the real estate investment groups? They may, yeah, some of them will be. And if you go on to some of the Zillow and Trulia type of thing, and uh -huh. if you can search for houses that need work, 
if you find those and notice what agents are listing them, what you'll find is quite often you'll find an agent that is repeatedly listing houses that need work. They're targeting investors. Uh, and so if you can find that subset of real estate agents that specifically So in the deal, write up on Zillow it'll say right. needs work because right. you're not going it's not yeah. move in ready. Right. And you can start by Googling Houses that need work in Tucker or Atlanta or wherever. Okay. Houses that need work, houses below market, that sort of thing. So there, the, so um, those agents are are trying to target that, so they'll know. Now, once once you've kind of started doing that, how do you know where when it's a good buy? That's a little I, harder. How do we determine that? That's called homework. Okay. The first thing you want to do is is figure out what that house. If you find a house figure out what that house is worth in retail condition. It, when it's fixed up. When it's fixed up. We call that ARV or after repair value. Okay. So you either do it yourself or get a real estate agent to pull the comps and look at what that house would be worth after it's fixed. Okay. Then you go in and look at the house with a contractor if you need that assistance and get them to give you an estimate to get it fixed to retail condition. So what if right. I want to do it myself? Well, if you know how to make those estimates yourself, then fine, do that yourself. If you don't know how to do it, I would encourage you to get somebody that does. Okay. Contractor or an investor that knows that so that there's two things you've got to get right when you're looking to buy a house, fix it up and sell it. Uh -huh. Okay. You've got to get the after repair value accurately. You've got to know what it'll sell. You've got to know where your number is. Yep. And secondly, you've got to know what it'll cost to fix it. And there's a third cost in there that we call it holding costs. And it's the cost of purchasing it, the closing cost when you buy it, okay. the holding cost, which includes taxes, insurance, utilities, and, uh, that sort of thing. Interest on the money Interest, if you borrow it. payments you have to make, any of the costs you pay while you're holding it, and then the cost to sell it on the back end, marketing costs, closing costs, that sort of thing. So you you got to you got to do your homework and get that all of that reasonably accurately. So if you if you bought an average hundred thousand dollar house. Well, that's, that's probably too low for Alpharetta, Roswell, North yep. Let's say you yep. bought it. Say you could find one for $200,000. Right. And um, uh, and say you could put 25% down on that house, okay? So let's just say you got a $150,000 loan, roughly. What what kind of holding costs am I talking about? How do, how, I mean, is that $1,000? Well, holding costs, you can get a rough estimate. They'll be somewhere between a half a percent and 1% of the value of the house per month. Of the, of the house value. Of the so house basically value. about two grand a month. W one to two grand a month. And okay. it, it depends on what you're, if you, it's much larger if you've got a note to pay. If you borrowed money to buy that house. Then that goes That's up. one of the biggest pieces. So cash is one, is one to two. Right, right, right. Um, but then the obvious ones are insurance, taxes, uh, utilities, and any maintenance, uh, yard maintenance landscape that has to be done while you're holding it, cutting the grass, if you're here in the summertime in the, in the south. Yeah, you gotta cut the grass, though. But the biggest one probably is, uh, in addition to the rehab costs themselves, the biggest cost is the, the carrying the money. If you borrowed money and you're gonna be making payments each month, that's a significant cost. Do most of the investors borrow the money or are they paying cash? Oh, uh, I would say the vast majority borrow money. And, and if you borrow money to buy a house short term to fix it up and sell it again, that money is, it's a commercial loan. And the uh, the name that of means that a is, bank loan, not well, necessarily a, a a Fannie Mae mortgage loan. It's yeah, it's not a mortgage. A mortgage is typically referring to a, a longer term loan for a house that you're going to live in. These short term loans that are commercial loans are typically six to nine month loans, and they they uh, balloon at the end of six to nine months. They're referred to as hard money loans, and they're more expensive interest rate wise and points and so forth than a mortgage. But they work. If you're going to buy a house, fix it up, and sell it, make enough profit to make it worthwhile, these short-term commercial hard money loans don't kill the deal. They're expensive, but they're so, available. All right. So I find this. All right. So hang with us. I'm going to ask ask John um, some more really good questions. Okay. So John, what I want to know is, I'm looking at this house, and. Um, and I think it'll retail for two hundred thousand dollars. Let's just yep. say, or I, let's say I can buy it for. Uh, I don't know. Help me figure out a scenario. What I'm trying to get to is that wh how much profit do I need to make to say yes, I need to go do this deal versus this deal's too skinny. 
Well, to state the obvious, Beach, uh, a person doing this casually as a side thing doesn't really need to make nearly as much money on each deal as we do when we're doing it professionally for a living full time. Okay. We buy houses at a pretty deep price, deeper than you would think. And we, we'll, we'll make easily in a $200,000 house, oh, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on the average buy, fix, and sell. All right, so explain that to me. Well, it, that's the profit we're typically targeting in that price point. We're, so 200000 after you buy it, you put all the money in it, all your holding costs, you think you're going to make about thirty k out of it. Yeah, that's an average price probably for that price point house. Okay. Now, people doing that as a casual sideline part-time gig for fun don't necessarily need to make that much money. But if you want to take that idea and turn it into a business, you've got to know, make enough money to justify doing it and carrying all the costs of the ongoing business. So you're going to target a higher right, profit. Because now you, now you don't have a regular nine to five job backing right. you up. You're going over right. there. You're, that's your gas money and your mailing right. money. Right. So, but what about if, um, so I mean, so in that same scenario, when I can buy an X and I've got to put X amount in it, how do you know, well, how do you say that's too much to put in it? You know, maybe you can buy that. Maybe it's a two hundred thousand dollars house, and you can buy it for fifty thousand dollars, but it needs a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Do yeah. you ever say that's there's too Absolutely. much chance, too much risk? Absolutely, and and that's an individual decision. Beach, we've got we've got people that I work with on a daily basis that are professional uh, contractors. Okay. They buy houses, fix them up, they rehab them for other people, they rehab them for themselves. That's what they do. They're contractors. Uh, they can tackle a big job like a hundred thousand dollar repair on a two hundred thousand dollar house but somebody who's not used to doing that I would caution them don't take on that big a job for anybody that's new what they really should do is take on what I call a light rehab the the best house to rehab for somebody that's new and learning it would meet two criteria number one the neighborhood is a quick selling neighborhood the days on market is short and that would be how much in your mind Oh, 20 to 30 days on average. So they're flipping uh, every month. Well, houses are selling. They're turning over. Okay. Okay. Number two, it's a light rehab. So for anybody that's getting into this new, they need to stick to light rehab. Paint, carpet, some minor repairs, some landscaping, that sort of thing. Not major structural repairs, new roof, new subfloor, new you know, foundation repairs. Bathroom and kitchen? Well, it, it again, it depends on the, the background and, and skill set knowledge of the investor doing it. Okay. They've got to decide where they're comfortable and where they're not. And that partly depends not only on them, but the resources they have available. If they've got a great contractor that can do that sort of work cost effectively and quickly, great, they can probably tackle more. But if they don't have the, the resources, the contractors and laborers to do right. that, and they don't have the experience, I would encourage anybody to stick with the lighter rehabs until they get used to it. Work into the bigger rehabs slowly and carefully. So let's talk about contractors. So, okay. you know, my buddy's a contractor and he says, oh yeah, he walks around, yeah, I, I think, you know, Beach, I think you can do this for $30,000. Right. What's right. your experience on that? Because I, I find that a lot of people don't really have a, a, a big experience on working with contractors and right. they're always right. getting getting taken to the cleaner. Right. The guy's asking for his check on Friday, right. he's not right. finished. Yeah. They all think that's funny until they start getting yeah. to be real money. Yeah. So how do you handle that with your contract? Carefully, <laughs> we uh, we teach our franchisees number one never pay a contractor up front, never pay them before the work is done. We typically teach them to take a job, break it into four, five, or six pieces, get that all delineated on own paper with the contractor, all of it bid, all nailed down, and the payments schedule so that the contractor knows not to ask for money before Until phase X one is done. is done. Yeah, phase okay. one's done, they get paid got to be done completely, got to be done correctly. Okay, so okay. We, we need the, the homeowner or rehabber, us, we need to be able to recognize when it's done and recognize when it's done correctly and only then do you pay that contractor. Most contractors will ask you for money up front to get started. Right. I don't ever let them get there. I explain the way we do it before we get to that So you just tell them we're going to do this and this, I'm going to pay you at these intervals and I'm not paying you up front. That's right. That's right. And they buy the materials and they provide the labor and I pay when both both are completed, right? So even the materials, yep. you make them pay for the materials up front and then yep. they hand you one invoice at that, That's right. at that time. That's right. If you don't pay for the materials, if you order the materials from Home Depot and they show up, 
Contractor's there. They unload them. Contractor will call you the next day and says, Beach, your materials are gone. <laughs> <laughs> I had that happen a couple of times. So I let them buy the materials. And if those they materials watch them a little gone, closer that way, right? They a lot closer. And that way if they take them home, they pay right, for it, that's right? right? That's right. Again, I pay, I pay when the work is completed and was done correctly and not before. Okay. What about, would you suggest that people always use a real estate agent on the sale or for sale by owner? How would you look at that? Depends on the market. If you're experienced at selling houses retail, you may not need an agent. But selling a house retail, retail meaning selling to a homeowner, mm -hmm. is a challenging process. There's The homeowner comes with a, a real estate agent, they come with an appraiser, they come with a home inspector, and it's a, it's a challenging process to get through. Mortgage officer, loan mm -hmm. situation. There's a lot to do, and if you don't know how to navigate that process, you're better off to just get a re uh, real estate agent to do it for you. So in the beginning, maybe make sure you use a, a really good contractor. Make sure right. you got a really good agent who, right. I guess, right. for sure knows the area. Right. Right. What about advertising the house once you've finished it? Do you have any suggestions we, we, on that? No, we don't do a lot of advertising when we're selling houses retail. MLS is the market. And if you want to sell at retail, unless it's a very, very hot market, if it's a super hot market, stick a sign in the yard. And people call and somebody you. Somebody will call you, but what about Zillow? You know, what happens, the listings that are in Zillow come from MLS. When you list it with your agent, the agent will put it in MLS, and the MLS feeds Zillow and Trulia and HomeSnap. That's, that's, oh, okay. that's where those listings come from. So it'll get in there without you doing anything. So they're pulling out of that database. Pulling it out of MLS. Okay, so right. what am I missing? Well, what do you what do you find that your yeah, buddy? Because you know yeah. everybody's got a friend that wants to do. Yeah. It. Well, this business is like many other businesses. It looks easier from the outside than it turns out to be, right? Right. And if it was as easy as it looks like, everybody would be doing it, right? Right. It can be done though. It's a great business. Uh, it's it's like anything else. You have to focus on it, do your homework, move carefully and slowly until you get it down. But the first place to start is make sure you understand what that after repair value, that retail value is. Make sure you understand what it's going to really cost to fix it. And make sure you can control the time frame for the whole thing. Because even a good house at the right price and a good rehab with a good contractor that takes three times as long as it should is going to come back and bite you, right? How important is it to do a house in a market area that you understand like in your town versus going to the other side of Atlanta, for instance? I would always encourage you to do it in an area that you know and that is easily accessible to you. If you go across town in an area you really don't know, before you actually buy there, just get to know the neighborhood. If you find a house across town, right. take the time to study the neighborhood, find out how fast houses are moving, which ones are selling right, look at the school districts, look at all the things that influence the sale of houses in that particular neighborhood and make sure you understand that before you make a final commitment to buy a house. All right, go. I'm going to come back and do another quick question. Okay, John, so, you know, everybody watches these TV programs and they go to these seminars and people are bringing people in the room. There's all these different ways that you can buy a house. Yeah. Address some of those different things. Some of the ones like, hey, this is too complicated or it's too risky. Some of them are like, hey, people need to really look at this better. What What are some yeah. of those ways that those, I want to call them TV preachers, these TV real estate preachers are, they're, you know, their way of doing stuff? Well, a lot of that, as you can guess, is not really accurate or realistic. Um, we, we get houses a couple of ways. As I talked about earlier, we talk to real estate agents and other investors and we advertise to the public that we buy houses. That's where we get the majority of ours. So as to how to buy them, we do the old fashioned pay cash for them. We get a house, if we can get at a below market price that makes sense to us, we just pay cash for it. That cash quite often comes from one of those commercial loans. We call it a hard money loan. Mm -hmm. And that's where that cash is coming from a lot of times. Some of it occasionally is coming out of our pocket. If we're, you know, extra cash on the table, we'll go buy a house with cash. People also buy houses in, in what I th might think of as more advanced ways get the deed for free. If somebody's got a little equity in the house but not enough to go through the agony of trying to sell it and capture a small remaining amount of equity, there are investors out there that focus on going to those sellers and getting the deed given to Maybe them. Maybe somebody's in trouble or yep, something? Somebody's or in struggling trouble. Struggling to make the payment? Can't make their payments, need to move to Florida or whatever. An investor will take the deed for free 
and promise to take over the payments on that house. That can be hazardous to both parties, so I wouldn't encourage that for people that are new in the game. That's a, what so I, I go to my friend, he's struggling, he gives, he signs a quick claim deed to me, yep. and so now I have interest, do I take him off of the interest or does I leave him on the, on the deed? Does he give me 100% of the deed? Yes, yes, it's typically 100%, but if you were selling a house and you had a mortgage on it and somebody asked you to get to give them the deed, be careful that your name is going to remain on the mortgage even if it's not on the house. And if that buyer... Right. So if I'm the guy selling to you, right. I give you my title, but I'm still responsible for the mortgage. And I'm hoping you're paying it every month. And if that buyer doesn't pay it, your credit's getting damaged and his is not. So I, I don't encourage that unless um, both buyer and seller are well informed and understand that process. And that's, that's fairly true. Where can that be beneficial? Like, would that be beneficial with a relative? Uh, perhaps. It, it's beneficial anywhere it's a fit for both parties and both parties are going to do what they say they'll do, right? Okay. So there are a lot of situations where that might work and might be good, but if the parties are strangers, they don't know each other, and they can't rely on each other, it's, it's a risky approach to that. Okay. Anything else that you see on TV that maybe people need to know about? Well, the TV always makes things look more glamorous and easier than it is. This is a great business. It can be very profitable, full-time or part-time, but it does take some time and homework and careful consideration to get it right. It's not as easy as it looks, just like everything else in life, right? So th this this group that you're involved with, I mean, uh, uh, if I wanted to, to buy a house, could I engage with somebody or go to RIA? What would you suggest I do if I kind of want to get started? buying houses. The Real Estate Investor Association groups, the RIA groups, uh, are a good place to start. Go there, meet the people. There's a lot of education that happens there. They're typically selling books and tapes. There's a lot of investors there you can get to know and make friends. So maybe with I can meet a guy that's yeah. advertising, he's buying houses and he would wholesale right. me a house? P potentially, yeah. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. And um, then I could spend my time and money on fixing it up to, right. to see if that works. Yep. Yeah. Am I missing anything else? No, other than it just, you know, it takes time and energy and you just got to be careful, right? Yeah. Well, that kind of concludes our nice talk with uh, John and I hope you've learned something today. You know, being in the mortgage business, I get a lot of people calling me about going to do this, going to do that. And, and so I felt like it'd be very helpful to bring John on and kind of explain it from a guy that's done it hundreds of times. It's not his first deal. So, John, thank you so much You're for welcome, coming, Dave. and and I hope it was very helpful, and and uh, and uh, we'll see you on the next time that we interview local rock stars.